Hi, I'm Nick Egabo, a production engineering manager here in New York. I work on messaging infrastructure, which powers Messenger and Instagram Direct. Today, I'm joined by my colleague, Joe. Hi, I'm Joe Gasparetti. I'm a production engineer here at Meta. And it's hard to believe, but I think I caused my first SEV eight years ago at this point. I'd like to think I learned a few things along the way, and I can't wait to talk about our SEV process today with you. Joe and I are super excited to be joining you from the New York office here. We're also excited because after we present, we're going to run to the micro kitchen and grab some snacks. Anyway, that's enough about me and Joe. Let's get into the presentation. Before we get started, let's define what we mean by SEV. When a system malfunctions and requires manual intervention, we refer to that as an incident. Anytime your favorite web service went offline, I guarantee you that some engineer somewhere was working on an incident. When we use the term SEV, we're referring to our tracking system for responding to technical incidents. Folklore says that the term may have come from the term site event or severity, but today it stands alone in our own culture. When we talk about SEVs today, we're referring to the way we report on technical incidents, the tools we use to respond to them, and the process that we use from trying to learn from them. In today's talk, we're going to share why we believe filing more SEVs is a good thing and some learnings from the industry that led us to that conclusion. After that, we're going to spend some time talking about our SEV process here at Meta and the ways that we've learned from the industry. Finally, we're going to wrap up by talking about our SEV review process in detail, which includes some anecdotes from SEV review. So Joe, I've heard you say before that more SEVs is a good thing. As somebody that's worked on a lot of SEVs, I find that hard to believe. Surely you can't be serious. Well, Nick, I am serious. As us New Yorkers like to say, stuff happens. Anyone working on complex systems knows that sooner or later, something is going to break. And academics have theorized that breakdowns are actually an inherent part of complex, tightly coupled systems. So incidents are going to happen whether we like it or not. The question is how we deal with it. When I say filing more SEVs is a good thing, what I mean is that I trust our process to help us resolve issues that do occur and learn from them so that they don't repeat in the future. Hold on a second, Joe. I hate to interrupt, but I had to intervene. The audience is probably thinking the exact same thing that I am right now, which is like, this all sounds great in theory, but is there any actual evidence that supports your claim? Okay, Nick, I didn't know you were such a skeptic. The good news is that there is evidence, and I'll give some of it to you right now, but feel free to ask more questions if you have any. Okay, I may be back if I have more questions. All right, thanks, Nick. Aviation is one of the most tightly regulated industries in the world, and for good reason. Pilots have a saying that regulations are written in blood. What that means is that most regulations were written to prevent the repeat occurrence of something bad that happened in the past. But aviation was not always so consistently safe. Over the past 50 years, flying on airplanes has gotten an order of magnitude safer, and learning from failures was the biggest factor in allowing that to happen. Here's a story. June 1960, TAA Flight 538 is descending to land in Queensland, Australia. It suddenly loses contact with the controller. Five hours later, Wreckage was found floating in the ocean miles from the airport. And as a result of this incident, sadly, 29 people died. How precisely the aircraft ended up in the water is a mystery to this day. But the process of investigating that incident eventually led to a mandate for flight data recorders in all aircraft. And it's these recorders that have given the aviation industry tremendous insight into future incidents like the recent Boeing 737 issues. This new data has then in turn prevented even more accidents from happening in the future. So the point here is that by studying past failures, we can improve the reliability of complex systems. And it's a point that's not only true in this particular case, it's also true in aggregate. In the year 2000, a study was conducted correlating the risk of airline fatalities with the number of incidents filed by those airlines. This table shows types of safety incidents recorded by airlines and how they're correlated per 100,000 departures to fatalities. All of the correlations are negative. That is to say, airlines which record more incidents kill fewer passengers. And as we go down the table, the types of events become more and more severe. In other words, the closer to death an airline has gotten its passengers, the less likely it is to actually bring them there. This correlation reinforces the opportunity for learning that near misses present. Anyone who's worked on a major technical incident knows how many more follow-ups we take away from total outages compared to minor issues. So Nick, I hope we've now proven that filing incidents creates opportunities to improve the reliability of complex systems. Okay, I think I'm sold that filing incidents provides an opportunity to improve the system's reliability. But the people who work on SEVs frequently have all types of other work to do. 
So is there a negative consequence for letting some stuff slip? Well, actually, it does turn out that there are negative consequences for not filing incidents as well. I may be an airplane nerd, but examples in this space can be drawn from other industries too. So here's some data from a 15-year study of construction sites in Finland. The x-axis shows fatality rate for a given year, and the y-axis shows the frequency of events for that same year. So each dot here is a year. Again, the correlation is negative. This suggests that filing fewer incidents leads to more injuries. So now that we've shown not only that filing more incidents improves safety, but also filing fewer incidents leads to worse outcomes. Okay, I can see how that makes sense. I think you've convinced me that raising more SEVs is a good thing, and missing out on those opportunities to file SEVs is a risk. But the real question is, what can we do to encourage people to file more SEVs? Aviation provides another source of inspiration for encouraging incident filing as well. Let me tell you about ASRS, the Aviation Safety Reporting System. ASRS is a program run by NASA to collect and analyze reports of safety violations. And the key to this program is getting lots of high quality reports. The way they incentivize reports is by offering immunity to the reporter, which includes self-reporting your own mistakes and violations of the rules. Flying a plane or being an air traffic controller is complex. There are lots of technicalities and regulations involved, and it's easy to make a mistake. It would also be easy to cover up many of these mistakes. So the immunity that ASRS provides is a real incentive. For example, NASA looked at a series of reports by helicopter pilots flying air ambulances. The reports all called out that talking to the paramedics in the back of the plane had distracted the pilot into a dangerous situation. As a result of these reports, a new policy was recommended to isolate pilot headsets from the paramedics in the back during most of the flight. Now, would these pilots have reported these near misses if they thought they would have been held liable for the mistakes? Maybe not. Thanks for sharing that example, Joe. Speaking of emergencies, now's a good time to bring it back to our industry. While we may not be flying planes, reliability is still important to us and our users. For example, many years ago, we had a total outage of Facebook.com when our web servers ran out of memory. During the outage, individuals started calling 911 to do something about it. So, even if lives aren't immediately at stake, the reliability of our services matter. We believe the importance of reliability is directly related to the scale of the services that we run. Now that we've reviewed evidence from other industries, we'll talk about how we've applied some of those learnings throughout the life cycle of a SEV at Meta. Here you will see what we consider to be the full life cycle of a SEV. During the identify phase, the goal is to detect problems quickly and notify people that an incident is occurring. The way that we notify people and mobilize to resolve the issue is by filing a SEV. It's not uncommon for the person who discovered the incident not to be the best person to resolve it though, and therefore, processes and tools for effective escalation are a must for us. As we get the right people involved, it's essential that we remain focused on minimizing the impact to users even if we haven't nailed down the root cause. Of course, the way that we ensure we only make new mistakes is by learning from our old ones and preventing them from recurring. SevReview ensures that we make it easy for folks to collaborate and draw the best lessons from our incident reports. Any urgent preventative work can be prioritized there. Maintaining behaviors like these requires continual investment. So Joe, you file a lot of SEVs, so why don't you come on and talk to us about our philosophy of filing SEVs here at Meta? Dubious honor, Nick. <laughs> I'd be happy to. So as Nick mentioned, the first phase of a SEV is identification. You have to know an incident's going on before you can do something about it. But it's not usually that cut and dry. So we have a rule of thumb. When it comes to filing SEVs, we say, SEV early, SEV often. If an engineer is ever asking themselves, should I open a SEV right now? The answer is always yes. To encourage this principle in practice, we've tried to make the SEV filing flow as easy as possible. And here's what it actually looks like. We've tried to minimize the, num the amount of information that people have to fill in by giving good defaults everywhere possible. In fact, the only thing you have to fill in is a title. And every engineer, as they go through our boot camp at the beginning of their career here, goes through this form. So everyone who ships code has filed at least one SEV in their life. Sometimes new folks ask, what if I file a SEV, but it turns out not to be a problem? And to alleviate this, we've introduced false po the concept of false positive into the tooling. So there should be no consequence for being over eager to file SEVs. But just filing a SEV doesn't fix problems on its own. And so the next phase of the incident lifecycle sets up communication. How does that work, Nick? So as Joey pointed out, filing a SEV doesn't actually fix the issue on its own. We need the right people involved to resolve the problem. 
The term escalation of meta refers to the process of actually getting those right people involved on the SEV. We don't actually see it as a dirty word. We want people to be unafraid of escalation. If you don't have the right people, find the right people. As a cultural principle, everyone at the company who ships code is expected to be in an on-call rotation. To support this, the ability to escalate to specific people in on-call rotations is actually built into our SEV tool. As you can see, after you've created a SEV, our tool will actually bring up an escalation panel. And on that panel, we display on-call rotations that might be related to the SEV based on the impacted areas that you've selected. This also allows you to search for any person or on-call rotation within the company and escalate to them directly. Another good example of how we support escalation is the IMOC or Incident Manager on-call role that we have. IMOCs are both proactive for monitoring for SEVs, but also available to be pulled into SEVs if they need additional support. IMOCs are experts in escalation, and their mission is to assist in mitigating SEVs as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And speaking of mitigating SEVs, imagine this hypothetical scenario. A product is malfunctioning in production. We've identified a code change that looks related and all signs are pointing to it as the problem. Now, we have to make a choice. Should we revert the change as soon as possible, or should we write and deploy new code to try and fix this likely bug? At Meta, we want engineers to bias towards the fastest path of mitigation, and often the fastest path of mitigation is to revert the change. To encourage that, we've made it as easy as possible to revert changes that were made to production. The simplest example of this is the unland button that we allow to revert any change that's been rolled out to production in a single button press. So the final and most important phase of the SEV lifecycle is learning. But before we get into the principles here, let me tell you a little bit about our SEV review process. SEV review is when we pour over everything we know about an incident to make sure it never happens again. And as a moderator, I personally think this is the best part of our incident management culture. But before a SEV can be reviewed, it has to have an incident report. Incident reports at Meta follow a handy acronym, DERP. Each of the letters corresponds with a phase of the incident response, D for detection, E for escalation, R for remediation, and P for prevention. Once we've used this acronym to write a little paragraph about each of these phases, it's time to go to SEV review. Every Friday morning for the past 10 years, engineers have gathered in the same room in Menlo Park for the company's main SEV review. Nearly every meeting has been attended by the head of infrastructure, head of production engineering, and engineers of all levels. In fact, most reviews are open to any engineer in Meta. Over the past decade, logistics have shifted. We've gone remote first now with video conferencing, and we don't just have one meeting anymore. With tens of thousands of engineers and offices around the world, we have meetings all over the place. However, the format and the style of each of these has stayed the same. For each SEV, an engineer involved in the incident takes a few minutes to talk about the incident report that they've written. After that, we have a question and answer discussion with open participation from the room. Even though we now have many SEV reviews, main SEV review is the most well attended and participated in. And for that review, we only put four to five SEVs on the agenda every week for two hours. That means there's always time for a lively discussion of each incident. In fact, the average SEV gets 12 questions and 450 unique individuals asked a question at main SEV review in the last year. So even though we're ostensibly talking about problems, SEV review is a beloved and cherished part of our culture. And there's three ingredients that keep that true over time. First, we take it seriously. The head of infra and other key engineering leaders come every week to main SEV review, and that includes both managers and engineers. Other engineers go to their local SEV reviews. The presenters show up with complete incident reports ready to discuss what happened and how they plan to prevent it from happening again. Two, the process reflects our value of being open. Presenters don't show up alone. They bring the whole team. Similarly, engineers across the company attend SEV reviews where they weren't even involved in the SEVs so that they can share personal wisdom or learn from themselves about how things can break. Of course, there are exceptions to openness where it's not appropriate to talk about security or privacy openly, but these are uncommon exceptions to the rule. And finally, and what I think is the most important part, is that we always assume good intent. Nobody shows up to work to do a bad job. We hire smart, independent people, and we trust them that make rational decisions given the circumstances around them. Severview discussion reflects this belief that systems and processes fail, not people. In fact, the people most directly involved in an incident are best positioned to help us fix it, learn from it, and prevent similar issues in the future. And that learning can only happen if they're free from stigma. Having a blameless incident management culture is easy to say, but harder than it seems. 
Unfortunately, human beings are hardwired with both hindsight and outcome bias. Bad things that happened in the past seem preventable in, the, in, in retrospect, and innocent mistakes seem like bad decisions once we know the outcome. In order to keep Cyberview positive, the moderator always has to be ready to jump in and remind people we're here to learn, not to blame. Here's a little story from a few years ago that helped me understand this. It was a summer Friday afternoon, and I was a junior engineer attending main server view just to listen. Another engineer came in to present, and it was clear that they were pretty nervous. I think they were new to the company. They had definitely never presented at main server view before. So they looked over at the moderator, who was the head of production engineering, and stuttered something like, um, how do I start? What do I do? And the moderator said, well, first you have to apologize for your mistake. And the entire room broke out in laughter. The joke makes some important points. First, everybody knew it was a joke. Nobody needs to apologize in main set review. The more subtle point is that we can take our work seriously without taking ourselves seriously. And to illustrate that further, the moderator said, hold up your hand if you've ever caused a sev before. And all of the hands in the room went up. This moment of levity helped this first time presenter get comfortable enough to jump in on the report. No apology necessary. While we've made great strides in our engineering culture and tooling around SEVs, there's still a lot more work to do. One of the hardest problems that we face is efficient collaboration on large SEVs. Even simple things like updating a document or getting a bunch of people on a video call can actually be really difficult when you've got dozens of engineers working on a problem. Another challenge is over-reliance on our own internal tooling. For example, most engineers rely on our escalation tool to find the right teams to escalate to for certain SEVs, something that we saw before. When these tools are unavailable, it can slow us down. To alleviate that, we've implemented offline redundant tools. Unfortunately, that means we now have two sets of tools, and so we also need to get incident responders familiar with those sets of tools. One of the funnier issues that we've hit scaling is that we've done such a good job of encouraging engineers to raise SEVs that we actually don't have enough reviews to review them all. One way that we've been addressing this is by creating additional SEV reviews but as we create more SEV reviews for narrower or more specialized areas, we get less diverse perspectives from people and we get less shared learnings across the company. As Nick's pointing out, dealing with SEVs is a constantly evolving problem. But as long as incidents happen, we will continue adapting and learning. I hope this presentation gave you some insight into Meta's SEV culture and values and how they help us build reliable systems at scale. Thank you. Thank you.